Okay, so in what context will we use the velocity selector? We kind of use it in this device called the mass spectrometer. So the thing about CIE physics is that they always, they're like cheating you a bit lah. They teach you this, but they don't tell you it's a mass spectrometer. Then you kind of like, did I learn it? Yes, you did. Okay, so the idea of a mass spectrometer is pretty amazing because we use the idea, two big ideas. Number one, I can choose particles of a certain velocity and allow them to travel. Like I use, I pass it through this velocity selector. You can see there's a velocity selector here. And after exiting the velocity selector, the particle will turn at different radius depending on the charge and the mass. And based on where the angle of this uh, turning, I can actually separate out different different isotopes or if you learn chemistry, uh, know the relative abundancy or percentage of different isotopes. Okay, so if you think about your AS, we talk about isotopes being two different things or two, two or three different particles, nucleus, with the same proton number but different nucleon number. So then the masses are different. So if I ionize these particles, uh, they will hit or they will turn based on this diagram at a different angle based on how and what is needed. Lah. Okay, so it depends on the charge, it depends on the mass. All right, we'll look more about that later. But let's uh, try to figure out what are the effects that will change and what is exactly happening here. So you can see uh, on this particular drawing, uh, which is the same drawing that I've given. So on one note, it looks like this. But I'm just going to flip it this way. Because previously, when we talk about the uh, velocity selector, the orientation was like this. You have the magnetic field going inward, right? And you have a charged particle entering this way. So, magnetic field going inward, charged particle entering this way. So it's actually the same drawing, but flipped like this. Lah. Okay, so just because we rotate 90 degree, you should be fine. All right, so here we're going to put a bunch of positive charge. So part of the charged particle here, I'm going to put a bunch of positive Q here as well. All right, so we know that this charged particle will experience a magnetic force uh, towards the right and if you feel like how do I know again ah? well uh, once again I'm going to draw the direction of V so for positive charge the direction of V is the direction of current so you can do FBI okay so the direction of B is into the paper pointing finger is B okay the direction of your middle finger is going down so pointing finger going in middle finger going down, where is your thumb? Towards the right. Pointing finger in, middle finger down, thumb will point to the right. So you will notice that you will have a magnetic force pulling it in this direction. So the particle is here. FB is in this direction. Okay. Of course, to make sure that it moves in a straight line, we are going to need to have uh, the electric force pulling it in the opposite direction. No? Okay, so all of this is about quite standard one. And any particle that don't have this speed V, it will deflect. Lah. Either it will turn upwards or turn downwards and then it will collide with the wall of the velocity selector. Then you bye bye Leolo. Not chosen. Sad. So the direction of electric field has to go against the direction of the produce an electric force going against the direction of the magnetic force. So if Fe and Fb is the same, only a velocity of V will escape. Okay, so before entering, this V is a range of values. And after entering, this V will be a single value. All right, later I'll show you a simulation. But once you enter the uniform magnetic field, the electric field kind of only acts here only. Here to here only you got electric field. Okay, so after this, uh, there is no more electric field. Uh. So maybe this one for this force, I'll put this plate as positive. And then this plate will be negative or grounded. Uh. Let me ground the plate. Okay, so after this uh, velocity selector, the only field that is left is this uniform magnetic field. But because the particle only travel at one speed, so the turning is very clean. Uh, you only get one particular radius because 
when the particle arrives at this point in the velocity selector, the only force acting on it would be the magnetic force. Long color, my bad. The only force acting on it is the magnetic force. Okay? But the direction of velocity will begin to change. So your V would begin to be tangential as this thing begin to turn. Okay? And eventually it will collide with the wall. And then what we can do is we can place a detector here. So maybe a place where we can adjust the detector. So place a detector here and the detector can pick up, oh, I get this many collision or this many particles per unit time. So this is how we can detect. If you have particles of maybe slightly different isotope, maybe the second isotope is heavier, it has an extra neutron, then this uh, isotope will maybe travel heavier. Ma. Heavier means uh, harder to turn. So this particle will turn, 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 this one. Okay. So this one could be heavier isotope. All right. So I will I'll condense all of this in one note and do more particle analysis to help you understand uh, about how we use this to actually detect particles of the same charge, same velocity, but different mass. So there are quite a few variables here. We'll go back to one note now. Right, so we're back in one note, okay, and then you can see this is the same drawing that I've shown you just now. So when the velocity enter, I mean when the particle, this particle here, enter the velocity selector, this value of V is a range. So you have many, many values of velocity. But once you pass through the velocity selector, this value of V is one value. Okay, and the way we select for this value of V is to use the idea that in a velocity selector, the electric force will balance out the magnetic force. So this particle will travel in a straight line. All right, so I'm going to quickly write out the equation. This is QE and this is BQV. So at the end of the day, the velocity that you have, since Q will cancel out, will be equal to E over B. So any velocity that don't follow this ratio will not pass through this gap, no, tiny gap here. Okay, so once they pass through this gap, you can see that this particle is going to turn this way. All right, of course, the degree of turning will depend on a few variables. But just by the fact that the particle is turning this way, I know that the direction of the magnetic force, which I will indicate in purple, is here. So the direction of FB is this direction. Okay, if you want to take here, then the direction of FB is pointing up. So the direction of FB must always be perpendicular, okay? And uh, I guess this diameter will depend on a few factors. So to decide what factors will depend on the diameter, here is what we normally call a deflection chamber. There are many ways or many things to call this, lah, all right? So inside this deflection chamber, I can use the equation of FB is providing centripetal force. So that's why it turns long. You can see the direction of FB is all directed towards the center of the circle here. All right. So because of this, um, I can then say that uh, BQV is equal to MV square over R. So by some rearranging and cancelling, so I cancel off the, the value of V, I will get my R as MV over QB. Okay. Where V is the velocity this velocity of the particle and B is the magnetic field now so I'm going to label the magnetic field in green now so this is the magnetic field B. B so these two values are constant we don't change the uniform eh? uniform magnetic field and the velocity we also choose only one single velocity so V and B are constant B B constant which leave us with the idea that the radius of this circular part here, the dotted line here, is proportional to the ratio of mass over charge. Okay, so that's why you have this idea of specific charge, but you don't worry so much about it. Follow the question. The question will guide you whether you take M over Q or Q over M. Sometimes they will ask you to do charge per unit mass. So look at the units to help you decide how to ratio. But just based on this ratio, right, if let's say I trace out three parts of three different diameters um, as such, 
Okay, so you can see I've drawn the parts here for you. I mean, they are supposed to be semi-circle. So I got three parts, one, two, and three. And in terms of uh, increasing radius, of course, R1 is smaller than R2, which is smaller than R3. Okay, so normally when a mass spectrometer is operating, right, what they will do is if it's the old style one, they will put a detector screen here. Lah. So this entire part, they'll put some fluorescent screen to read the number of collision or number of particles. But we are a bit 20, 20, year 2020, 2021 now. So we actually can have a manual detector that moves. But either way, the number of particles detected per unit time will be measured. So number of particles is detected. So this gives you the rough percentage of the isotope. All right. So for example, there are three different isotopes. Uh, we can actually tell which isotope has more, uh, more component or in chemistry talk, more uh, relative abundancy, depending on the ratio of the number of particles. So maybe R1, for every 10 R1, you got 2 R2 and 4 R3, etc, etc. But just to remind reminder, just based on this, because I know R1 is less than R2 and less than R3, sometimes they will ask you to comment. So a few comments that I can make is, if the charge is constant, all right, then I will be able to say that the mass M3 is bigger than M2 is bigger than M1. The heavier particle turns with the biggest radius, okay? And similarly, okay, let me move around here first so you have space, or I have space. If M is constant, then I can say that the charge with the, because they are inversely proportional. So the bigger your charge is, let's say, for example, your Q3, okay, is uh, less, Q3 is bigger, so the force will be stronger, then the circle will be tighter. There will be more pulling in. So Q3 is less than Q2 is less than Q1. So sometimes they will ask you to do a basis of comparison or they ask you to sketch out a part and then they give you a new charge. Lah. So you can always use this relationship to help you determine this one. But I again don't suggest memorizing because I honestly don't think uh, this part where you derive out the relationship will take you that long. Okay, so that's it for the mass spectrometer. What are the main ideas? Number one, we are combining velocity selector and the fact that a deflected electron will move in a semicircle and the radius of that deflection here depends on the mass of the particle, number one, and number two, the charge of the particle. So most of the time, our charge is constant. So maybe our isotope have slightly different masses. No? Maybe R1 is carbon-12, R2 is carbon-13, and R3 is carbon-14. So they will deflect at slightly different angle, and we can measure the number of particles that deflect, let's say, in a certain period of time to decide the relative abundancy or the ratio of the particle. Let's say I find a block of carbon. I go and I go and dig some carbon from some ancient cave, and I want to know how old that skeleton is. So I take some sample from the bone, the skeleton bone, and then I put it through this mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer can actually tell me what are the percentage of carbon-14 that has already decayed and how many carbon-12 is there, etc, etc. That is carbon dating. So if you're interested in all these ideas, um, Google is your best friend. So we will also talk a little bit more about carbon dating and radioactivity in the final chapter of your A2. But carbon dating allows us to use an artifact, collect or scrape some tiny sample from it, pass it through a mass spectrometer, and then analyze how many percent of it is a certain, a certain type of elements or particles. So we'll be able to tell the molecule. That's why we call this a mass spectrometer. So we create a meter and a range of mass spec images. Okay, to help you visualize this, um, you can see that this is the velocity selector. They're going to arrange it slightly different than the way we draw it. So this is probably why if you are using my hard copy of my notes, I tend to leave the diagram empty. So you learn to sketch and interpret your own scientific diagrams. It's important, okay? Especially if you intend to pursue a career in science. So you can see here we have two slits. I'm just going to zoom in for you. This is your velocity selector. Before we enter the velocity selector, all the particles here have different, different speeds. Once they pass through the velocity selector, they have the same speed. So you can see here, I mean, it's a bit hard to tell, although I've slowed down the particle. 
but the purpose of this velocity selector is so that wherever particles come out here, they have the same speed, and you can see they'll deflect differently. So right now, if you can see here, we are putting in a detector. So after this deflection by the magnet, only the blue color particle will enter the detector. So maybe I allow this to pass two minutes, and then I calculate or I measure the number of particles or the number of pings I get in two minutes in this magnetic field. So you might be wondering what happened to the green and red. So it's obviously if you look here that the red is colliding with the wall because of the angle of deflection being too big. And so is the green one too big is colliding at this side of the wall. All right. So to allow the detector to pick up the green or the red particle, I have to change the angle of deflection. And the way I do it is by changing the magnetic field. So let's say now I use a medium magnetic field. Now the medium magnetic field means that the blue one cannot turn enough, so it will collide with the left side. Red one will still collide with the right side. So in the end of the day, you only get the green one. Okay, so when the magnetic field is medium, only green is the magical angle of uh, deflection to detect. And you can see we have way more green per unit time compared to blue. See, so much green enter the detector compared to, let's say I change it to blue. There's so little blue entering per unit time compared to the green. So this tells us the relative abundancy or the relative how many percent of each isotopes they are. So if we apply a strong field, now the red one will enter, of course, and the blue and green will not be deflected in such a way that allows them to pass through the slit. And of course, the relative abundancy of red is still less than green. Okay, so what will you get from the detector or what kind of graph do you get? The old style graph will look something like this. So if you have uh, done any chemistry before. This kind of relative abundancy graph is uh, very, very common. Okay, it's probably like chemistry 101, where we measure the relative abundance of things with a slight different mass. So this is their mass number, and you can see the ratio of 9 to 6 to 1. So for every one particle of 74 atomic number, I will get 6, 72, and 70, 90. So these are all just isotopes. All right, so of course we've got more complicated mass spectrometer. This this is hap this is very useful when we study isotopes or when we want to know. Let's say I have a sample. I want to know what are the elements that the sample is made out of and what are their respective ratios. Okay, so these are the big idea about mass spectrometer. We can use this to analyze all the things that we see, the chemicals that are in our lives. All right, so hopefully you find this explanation helpful. Do try some past year questions. Share like, subscribe, you know what to do. I'll see you in the next one. Maybe for some examples. Take care.